Are you tired of your garage serving as nothing more than a cluttered storage space? Ever dreamt of transforming it into a functional room that adds value to your home? Well, stay tuned because in this video, I'm gonna unveil how I converted my garage into a practical living space and the complete cost breakdown for the whole project. Welcome back to Loving Tech Life. And if we're meeting for the first time, I'm David Loving, and this is where I share my love of consumer and gaming tech with tips, tutorials, and reviews based on my experiences. Today's video is something a bit different. I'm thrilled to share with you an exciting project that I embarked on recently, the transformation of my garage into a fully functional room. From the initial planning stages to the final touches, I documented every step of the way, including all the costs involved. So if you've been considering a garage conversion but weren't sure about the budget, you're in the right place. I'm gonna share some invaluable tips I learned along the journey and make sure you stick around to the end of the video for the full cost breakdown. If you wanna to jump to various stages in the video, I've put timestamps in for everything. With that said, let's get into it. So a quick disclaimer before we jump into the details, it's important to note that this channel primarily focuses on consumer and gaming tech, not home renovation or building. While I've dabbled in DIY projects and home renovation in the past, I'm far from being a professional in this field. So if you're expecting expert level advice, you might be in the wrong place. That said, if you're curious about my experience converting my garage into a room and the costs involved, stick around. I'm sure there are plenty of decisions I've made that could have been improved upon, and I'm open to hearing your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below. To begin with, let me show you the garage space I had to work with, explain what I wanted to use this space for, and the reasons why. My garage is shaped like a long, narrow rectangle, approximately six and a half meters or 21 foot long, and two and a half meters or 8.2 feet wide. One side of the garage shares a wall with my living room, while the opposite side shares a wall with danger lava. Uh, sorry, my neighbor's house. Above the ceiling are the bedrooms upstairs. The front of the garage has a roller door while the back has a standard door leading to my backyard. So now you know the layout, let me explain what I wanted to use the space for and why. Before the renovation, the garage was just a storage room packed with stuff I plan to repurpose in my new room, as well as other various bits and pieces. But we still needed storage space. After some discussion, we agreed to designate an area near the roller doors as storage by placing a partition wall in about two meters or six and a half feet. The rest of the garage would be transformed into a room. This way we could optimize the storage by adding racks and using boxes while still having enough room for other larger items. There were four main reasons for adding this extra living space to the house. First, I wanted an office space for working from home. Second, I wanted a dedicated area for gaming. Third, I needed a space to record YouTube videos. And fourth, I wanted to move the internet modem and router kit out of the kitchen and into this new space. Since the pandemic, I've been working from home most days. When we bought this house, I spent the first two years working from our bedroom. Back when we were renting, I always had a spare room for my desk and gaming setup, but in this house, there wasn't any extra room available. We had grand plans to turn the garage into a workspace within a year, but time flew and two years later, I was still clocking in and out of my bedroom. It got awkward, especially when my wife needed to use the ensuite bathroom or do anything in the room while I was in a video meeting. It was definitely time to move my desk out of the bedroom for both my wife's and my own sanity. I have a long standing tradition of gaming online with some friends on Monday nights. These typically go for long after my family has gone to sleep. As the night wears on, the adrenaline kicks in and so does the volume of our banter. Meanwhile, upstairs, my poor wife is trying to catch some Z's only to be interrupted by my enthusiastic outbursts. I would often get a friendly message from my wife reminding me that she's trying to sleep. So when planning the new room, it became clear. It needed to be a fortress against noise blocking any chance of my gaming antics disturbing the peace, whether it was during my work meetings in the day or those late night gaming sessions. Ever since diving into the world of YouTube, finding a moment of peace to hit the record button has been like finding a needle in a haystack. With a vocal young family and a dog that loves the sound of his own voice, it can be a symphony of noise around here at times. Rather than waiting for a rare moment while they're out of the house, with a separate room, I could record any time. So again, soundproofing is definitely on the agenda. The fourth reason is that we didn't have many options when it came to where we put the internet router when we moved in. 
So we ended up with it sitting on a shelf in the kitchen. Not only is it not great for the router's long-term health, but it doesn't look good and it uses up valuable space in the kitchen. Now that you know the main reasons I wanted to convert the garage, you'll see how they helped to guide some of the decisions when it came to the renovation itself. The first step in week one was getting started with the renovation by emptying everything I could out of the garage so there was room to actually work in there. To keep costs down, I also set myself a deadline of getting everything completed within one month. This was because I decided the best way to store everything I removed from the garage was to hire a mobile storage box from a company called Taxibox. I called their customer service previously to discuss the options I had and whether it would be better to fill the box up and to take it away to their storage facility or to keep it with me for the month. I was really impressed with their customer service team and how helpful they were. In the end, I decided to choose a box that would fit into a car park space that we had and keep it with me for the month. This way I could move everything into it from the garage and also store some of the renovation materials like the insulation bats until I needed them. If I could do everything I needed within one month, it meant I didn't have to pay for more time to rent the taxi box. Keeping in mind that this also meant that I had to prepare ahead of time and ensure that any contractors I needed would be available to do their part at various stages. I was also working during the weekdays so the timing for everything was going to be pretty tight. I was actually so impressed by my experience with Taxibox that I reached out to them while making this video and they provided a discount code for my Australian viewers which you'll find in the description below. Fortunately I'd already prepped the floor when we first moved in a couple of years before and decided to epoxy the concrete floor to help seal and protect the surface. At the time I tested to see if there was any moisture coming up through the concrete and two years later it's still dry as a bone. I'm not going to take you through the epoxy process in this video but you can find plenty of them on YouTube with a quick search. Also depending on your setup you may need to make other arrangements for your flooring. To cut costs, I decided to reuse the existing window, but being a garage, it wasn't properly sealed against weather, insects, or sound. I also planned on updating the color of the aluminium window frame to match the new aesthetic and spray painting it with this satin granite paint and primer. Similarly, I planned to paint the aluminium door frame matte white. However, before painting, I had to seal the gaps between the window and door frames and the brickwork. I used a fire and acoustic rated sealant, applying it generously both inside and outside. Some areas around the window were so bad you could see daylight through the gaps. Once it's set, I moved on to spray painting. I removed the sliding part of the window and the flight screen, covering the area with newspaper to prevent paint from spreading. I lay the sliding part of the window and the flight screen down on some cardboard to paint separately. On the door frame, I used painter's tape here for clean lines and sprayed it with a matte white paint. Despite some paint getting on the bricks, it wasn't a concern as they would be covered with plaster later on. Overall, it was a practical solution for sealing and enhancing the aesthetics of the window and door frames. Moving on to the second week of the project, it was time to build the wood frame, a task where I definitely needed some expert guidance. Before kicking off the project, I reached out to a contractor I had worked with previously for some garden planter boxes and asked for a quote for my garage conversion. Luckily, he brought along a friend who could help with the plasterboard too. Replacing the door was also on the agenda since the small window wasn't letting in enough light, I opted for a door with a large glass pane to brighten up the space. I arranged for the carpenter to handle the wood frame materials and installation, while I would source the plasterboard and its friend would install it. Though it might have been cheaper to tackle this part myself, I didn't want to risk any mistakes due to my lack of skills and time constraints. A crucial aspect of the framing was the new partition wall, which needed to be soundproofed. After some testing, I realized the roller doors were about as soundproof as tissue paper. After discussing with a carpenter and doing some research, we decided on a similar design to a cinema room wall to block out as much noise as possible while staying within budget. To make this room as soundproof as possible, the top and bottom plate are thicker than the studs running up and down. This allows the studs to be alternated front and back so that each stud is only in contact with one side of the wall or the other, stopping the transmission of sound through the studs themselves. Typically, you then weave the insulation bats between the studs by laying them horizontally instead of vertically. However, my carpenter understood my explanation differently and instead of spacing them to allow me to weave them between the studs, he spaced them so I could place two layers of bats alternating on either side, which I think works just as well in the end. It just meant I didn't allow enough insulation and had to buy more later. 
There were a few more considerations to ensure the wall was soundproof, but we'll get back to that later. Once the studs were in place, my electrical contractor wasted no time and got straight to work. They roughed in all the cabling needed for power, data points, a TV antenna, and four downlight points for the room. They also replaced the old fluorescent light in the middle of the garage with a long LED tube for better illumination in the front storage area. Additionally, I requested a data point to be wired into the living room behind the TV. This would allow me to install a network access point, providing wired network access to that area and ensuring reliable Wi-Fi coverage throughout the house. I wasn't confident that the Wi-Fi from a single router on its own in a renovated garage with its thicker walls would reach all the areas of the house. During the wiring process through the wall into the living room, we made an interesting discovery. The wall turned out to be twice as thick as we initially thought, consisting of two double brick walls, one for the house and one for the garage. This unexpected thickness would greatly contribute to soundproofing later on. Once the electrical work was completed, it underwent inspection and was certified for safety. With the studs in place and the wiring roughed in, I seized the opportunity to enhance the soundproofing by applying more acoustic sealant. I carefully sealed the gaps between the studs and the brickwork of the new partition wall Additionally, I filled in any holes in the walls around the air conditioning, wiring, and plumbing. Before proceeding further with the construction, I made the decision to install a split system air conditioner for the room, and this was the best time to get the wiring done. At the end of the second week, I tackled the bat insulation myself. I opted for high density bats with top notch insulation and soundproof ratings, the highest ratings that would fit into the 90mm thickness of the studs. Besides keeping the noise at bay, they would also help maintain a consistent temperature indoors regardless of the weather outside. Handling these materials was a breeze, thanks to modern advancements and the materials they now use. Starting with the standard sized areas that didn't require cutting, I seamlessly fitted the bats into place. Here you can see how the partition wall can fit two overlapping bats. Incidentally, we kept a gap in this partition wall for the majority of the project to allow access in and out through the roller doors. For areas requiring custom sizes, I measured and cut the bats accordingly, even insulating the gap between the top plate for additional soundproofing. Heading into the third week, I kept going with the insulation. When it came to insulating the ceiling, I found it much easier to keep the bats in place using blue insulation strapping, which could be stapled onto the ceiling studs. This prevented them from constantly falling down. In fact, I had enough excess bats to add a second layer behind the ceiling bats with hopes to further enhancing soundproofing between the garage and upstairs rooms. Before putting up the plasterboard, a crucial step for soundproofing had to be taken. I debated using the thicker sound absorbing plasterboard for the whole room or opting for a mass loaded vinyl in specific areas like the partition wall and due to budget constraints, I had to choose one or the other. Ultimately, the performance of mass loaded vinyl in soundproofing far exceeded that of the best plasterboard, so I chose that route. Considering the cost, I couldn't cover every wall and the ceiling with it, Instead, I focused on key areas where it was most needed. Initially, I planned on using it on both sides of the partition wall, but decided against it for being excessive. Instead, I settled for a single side facing the roller doors and a wall shared with my neighbor's house just to be safe. The remaining pieces were used on the wall next to the back door. Installing mass loaded vinyl can be a bit challenging due to its weight. So having an extra set of hands to hold it in place while stapling against the studs is highly recommended. Despite its weight, it's easy to cut to size using a sharp blade. Then I simply use a staple hammer to hang the strips while it was held in place and used industrial high tack tape to seal the seams between the pieces. At the end of the third week of the project, with the insulation bats and mass loaded vinyl in place, it was time to bring in the pros for the plasterboard installation. We had booked a family trip for the weekend, so I had to trust that there wouldn't be any problems I couldn't handle from a distance. Thankfully, it all went to plan by the time we got back. I made sure to have all the materials, including the plasterboard and cornices, delivered before the contractor returned to site. This way, they wouldn't get in the way while I was working on the insulation. Getting the time timing right for ordering and delivering the plasterboard was tricky. I couldn't have it delivered too early while I was still insulating or it would be in the way, but I needed it on site before the contractors arrived to start their work. I opted for a 13 mm thickness of plasterboard instead of the standard 10 mm to provide a bit more soundproofing and the cost difference wasn't significant. The contractors also installed the final patch of mass loaded vinyl over the area for me before putting up the plasterboard. This was also when we sealed up the gap in the partition wall so there was no more going in and out from that side. Once all the plasterboard was installed and dried, the room started to take shape. Cornices and skirting boards were added, then I had my electrical contractor cut out the various power and data points, as well as cutouts for the downlights. Incidentally, the plasterboard contractors also commented to me on how well the soundproofing was working on the partition wall as they really struggled to communicate if they were both on either side of the wall while working. 
In the fourth week of the project, I still needed to paint and install flooring before I could empty and return the taxi box. I painted the walls and skirting boards myself and stained the door. For the walls, I used a water-based eco paint with zero VOC and low sheen from an Australian brand called EcoColor in a color called White on White. I used the same brand and color for the skirting boards called Eco Enamel, which had a durable glass finish. We had some leftover paint from painting inside the house, so this would keep the look consistent. I applied a couple of coats for each. To weatherproof and seal the door, I stained it with a couple of coats of a clear polyurethane wood finish. Once everything was painted and dry, my electrical contractor returned to complete the installation of data and PowerPoints, as well as installing the LifeX smart switch and LifeX smart downlights. As the deadline to return the taxi box approached, I had some final touches to complete. For the flooring, I opted for carpet tiles. I simply laid them directly on the epoxy concrete floor and trimmed the edges to fit. I suggest getting more tiles than you think you'll need, as there may be some wastage when cutting them to size. Since mine were slightly used, having extra tiles allowed me to select the best ones and replace any damaged or blemished ones. Additionally, I wanted to further seal the door from the elements and sound. Since the door and frame weren't flush, I used the trick I found. I applied more acoustic sealant in areas where the gap was wider, especially at the top, to ensure an even contact with the door seal I installed. I also invested in the best door seal I could find for the bottom of the door. Before returning the taxi box, I had to empty everything into the room and storage area. We installed shelves and boxes into the storage area to organize items that weren't going into my room. With five days left, I called taxi box and they picked it up three days before the rental month ended. Thankfully, everything went smoothly over the past four weeks, with no delays from contractors or material deliveries that would have extended the rental period. I quickly unloaded everything into the room and set up my desk so I could start working there. It's still a work in progress, but it's an amazing space that fulfills all my needs. I work there most days, giving my wife some peace in our bedroom. Gaming at night no longer disturbs anyone's sleep and sound doesn't travel into the living room during the day. I'm particularly pleased with how well the partition wall blocks sound. The only sound I hear is a gentle rumble when our car pulls into the driveway. I appreciate being able to close the window and door for quiet video recordings. Finally, I moved the internet router out of the kitchen and set it up to provide wired connectivity throughout the room including behind the TV for a second access point. With both wired and wireless access, we have all the connectivity we need. Let's break down the costs and where I spent and saved money. I started with a spreadsheet to plan this project, setting budgets for each component. As I researched options and weighed costs, I adjusted these budgets to fit my overall goal. For instance, I might spend less on plasterboard to allocate more to soundproofing with mass loaded vinyl. In another column, I tracked actual spending as I paid for each item, ensuring I stayed on budget. Sometimes costs exceeded my estimate while other times I saved money, helping me keep my finances in check. Please note that the figures provided are in Australian dollars. Keep this in mind and convert them to your local currency when comparing prices for your own research and shopping. Contractors and trades were a significant part of the expenses. I did what I could myself, but carpentry was beyond my skill set, so I sought professional help. The labor and materials for the frame totaled 3,700 in the estimate, but ended up around 4,000 due to some extras like door installation. Consulting directly with the contractors definitely helped keep costs down. Electrical work was quoted around 1,500, but ended up costing more than $1,900 due to additional requirements like certification and extra cabling for the air conditioning unit. The split system air conditioning unit cost $1,500 for supply and installation. Materials made up the rest of the expenses. I found insulation bats on Facebook Marketplace for $200, saving money from my $515 budget. Plasterboard ended up costing $524, slightly more than the $504 budget due to freight. I budgeted $400 for the door but spent $425. The tax Taxi box rental was $318 for drop off, pick up, and the monthly rental, and I only needed it for one month. I originally planned for one roll of mass loaded vinyl at $240, but ended up buying three for $711 which proved worthwhile for soundproofing. Carpet floor tiles were budgeted at 150, but I found slightly used ones for 100 bucks on Facebook Marketplace, and I installed these myself. A $100 contingency for extra materials ended up being 438. Lastly, I paid an additional $68 for the correct cornice after ordering the wrong one with the plasterboard. I omitted a budget for paint since I had enough left over from previous projects, and I painted it all myself. In total, the project cost just over 10 grand, which was within our estimated budget. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, drop them in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next video.